So good morning. Um, thank you for spending your Wednesday. It is Wednesday, right? Yes, with us. Um, my name is Lillian McNaney. I am an assistant curator at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. And as you know, we are all here today to chat with Michaela, Michaela Patton. A few things before we start. Um, to begin, I briefly like to acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening, even though we are in a virtual space and not physically at the museum today, um, in Ogopoge within the table world. As a non-native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Tewa people. And I wish to acknowledge all of the indigenous communities, Pueblo, Navajo, Apache, and so many others, past, present, and future who walk on these lands and steward these places. And I would encourage everyone um, watching today to also reflect on the lands on which they occupy. So for those of you who do not know, the Goodman Aspiring Artist Fellowship was established at MIAC by Dr. and Mrs. Connie Goodman, who are wonderful friends, members, and supporters of the museum. The fellowship is designed to provide financial assistance to up and coming native artists who, so, who show promise and are eager to move to the next level of their development. Goodman Fellowships have often opened doors to other opportunities for recipients, such as an artist residency at the School for Advanced Research or the Santa Fe Art Institute, or in this case, um, down in Roswell. Um, invitations to markets, as well as gallery and museum exhibitions. This program with Michaela is the sixth in our new lecture series from the Goodman Fellows. Recordings of each of these events are available on our YouTube channel, and these conversations will continue on a monthly basis throughout the rest of this year, but also bleeding into the next, um, generally the fourth Wednesday of every month at 10 a.m. So please keep an eye out. I'm on my social media and in our monthly newsletter for future dates and um, artists. So with that, I think I'll hand it over. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here with me in Zoom land. Um, really excited to be here. Uh, currently, I am in, in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, which is the original homeland of the Mascalera Apache. I want to first uh, share my gratitude to the Goodmans for the Goodman Fellowship. It's such a supportive uh, stepping stone for young artists. Uh, I received the fellowship right out of art school, and it couldn't come uh, at a more perfect time. I needed space and materials and a lot of support to continue working as an artist, and the, Good the Goodman Fellowship really um, provided the foundation for that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And also I want to thank the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture for hosting me today and for establishing this platform to engage artists like myself. <clears throat> so again, my name is Michaela Patton and I am a 2019 and 2020 Goodman Fellow. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into um, straight into me and my background. So I am an enrolled member of the Oglala Lakota Nation, uh, where I'm first a citizen of. I was born and raised on the Pine Ridge Reservation in so-called South Dakota, uh, where my people's territory surrounds the sacred Black Hills. I obtained a Bachelor of Fine Arts with a focus in printmaking from the Institute of American Indian Arts in, in uh, Santa Fe in 2019 and I've been working in New Mexico for mm, over, to, over two years now. And again, I currently reside in Roswell, New Mexico. So quickly, uh, I consider myself an off-res off -res multidisciplinary artist, meaning that I work in many, in, I work in multiple mediums in order to produce work but I, I get a lot of, I get those specifics. Um, sorry, I get, uh, I'll go into the specifics of the materials and mediums I work in a little later. Um, I'm also very process-based. Um, my work is developed in many layers um, and I'm very material-based as well. Um, so before I received the Goodman Fellowship, um, again, I was just finishing college and my focus was in printmaking. And um, I, 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 were, I was focusing in like specific um, printmaking types, processes. Um, and I'll go ahead and just dive into the work that I was doing. 
So this piece here is um, an intaglio and monoprint on cotton paper. The size of it is, I think, 30, maybe 30 by 40. It's a pretty large piece. Um, pretty large piece. And again, I'll go into the, the process a little later. Here's some more work that I did. Again, it's um, intaglio, it's intaglio process and mono printing on um, cotton paper. The one on the right here actually has um, oil uh, pastels on it as well. And these ones here uh, are actually uh, lino, embossment, and monotype on cotton paper. And so those were the pieces that I was working on. Um, those were my prints. Um, but my last year uh, in college, I started getting into paper making and I really fell in love with it. Um, a lot of that came from my paper making, my uh, printmaking process. I was going through lots, lots of paper and I had so much scraps left over. And at one point I like didn't want to get rid of it anymore. So um, I decided to just sort of make paper out of all of it. And this is kind of where that came from. So the paper here is the paper from leftover prints that didn't come out right or didn't print right or something. And so I made paper and then I did my prints on top of the paper. So it's kind of, you can see like the two coming together. Um, but I really fell in love with making paper. So I was really trying to see ways that I can push it and work with it. Um, also, while I was working with paper, I was had the opportunity to work with the laser machine, which is, you know, like a big industrial machine that just sort of with a, a, a laser, just I can, I'm able to cut and etch on top of my paper. So the, for this piece, um, I sort of just etched the top of it, um, which came out really nice. And these were a lot of pieces that I was playing with. So this one here is sort of a very small series that I finished. Here's the first one. And again, with the etching above it on top of the paper, apologize. And then also with uh, paper making, and my printmaking and the etching, I was sort of playing with all of those, um, all of those outlets, and I turned them into an installation, um, which uh, became my senior show, my BFA senior show. And here's some images. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to get as much great photos as I should have, but um, this is the finished product. Um, again, I was pushing, sort of pushing how I can, what else I can do with the paper. Um, and I really got interested in making, um, mimicking parflesh boxes, which is something that is like a Plains, um, a Plains cultural item. It was sort of an item that was developed to travel with their traveling trunks. And so I took that same idea and I, I turned my paper into boxes and um, stacked them. So this is sort of my first um, box kind of sculptural um, project that I did. And, and I titled it which is my Lakota name, um, which means daylight woman. So this piece here is really like focused on sort of me specifically um, starting from the bottom, going up kind of stages of my life. So each bo box kind of represents um, those parts of me. And this is sort of different angles of this piece. So materials, um, 
Uh, again, I'm a printmaker. I focus my undergrad in printmaking. I did a lot of monotyping in Talio. Um, really, I did all kinds of stuff, but monotyping and intaglio processes really I was more interested in. Um, with intaglio, I did a process called image on, which is on the picture here on the side. You can kind of see it involves um, getting um, using a light sensitive film and you laminate it onto a, a, uh, a plexi and there's it involves like a very long process but you laminate it on a plexi and then you let it dry um and you expose an image or you can take items any items that you have and just sort of put it on top of the 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 film and then you expose a light onto it for depending on um the 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 intensity of the light you you expose it for you know a couple minutes um and then you take it and you put it into a developer which is um half half water and half soda ash and you let it sit in there for roughly about eight to nine minutes you take it out you spray it with vinegar and then you you clean it with water and then you let it dry and then the intaglio process is pushing ink into the um the areas that you had images on, those areas actually become, um, what is the word? They, they create like a, a texture almost like embedded. And you, that's what you push the ink. That's where you push the ink into it, And then you clean off the surface and then you put paper on and you run it through a press and you can pull it and you have your image. Um, that is an, an um, image on process. And that's a process that I really love. And then, of course, paper making. Paper making um, is another uh, process that I really found love, love with. Um, it's it's another really long process, and that's that's a process I will kind of go into depth, and I'll show you more images of that. Um, my paper making again kind of comes from a lot of scraps that originally came from when I was doing printmaking. A lot of that that's where the scraps would come from. Um, now. I'm not doing as much printmaking as I am paper making. So uh, I'm kind of outsourcing my materials. Um, I'm, I go as far as collecting like old notes, um, even books. I, I just tear pages out of books and I can make paper out of that. Um, basically people's trash. I, I ask people for um, their, their scraps. Uh, I even use like mail uh, as long as it doesn't have so much ink on the paper, I can I can pretty much use it <clears throat> and repurpose it. Uh, I also use um, laser machines. I manage to get connected with people that have machines, um, which is really important for me because I'm able to really push um, different ways I could use the paper and. Um, and then again, making the paper more sculptural, which is sort of um, turning my paper into sculpture. And then uh, um, and then also installation where I'm turning my sculptures into installations. So the way I have it listed is sort of my um, almost my 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 own personal evo artistic evolution of kind of where I, I am now. So with my process, um, I. I start by tearing the paper, I break it down. Um, so here I have a picture of me kind of tearing it down. I like to tear it into, you know, like nice little pieces. Um, there's different ways you can make paper, but with my process, I basically just use a blender. Uh, it's easy and it's fast. It's I don't get to make as much as I wish that I could with one blender. So sometimes I'll get a couple of them. Uh, um, but the funny thing about using blenders is I'll go through a few of them. I'll usually break them. Um, so I try to find my blenders from uh, thrift stores. Uh, yeah, I've, I've definitely gone through a few of them. Uh, here's a picture of me working outside uh, blending paper. Um, I do have 
I, whenever I blend the paper, I pour it into a huge um, bin uh, full of water. And then I have um, molds where I take the molds and I basically just submerge them into the water with the paper pulp. And I pull the pulp up and let it drain slightly. And then the image here, I basically just um, flip the, the pulp onto um, sheets. Uh, bed bed sheeting in this case, which I use. And then in order to like manipulate sizes, I sort of just over layer um, the sheets of pulp. And then I'll, I'll just go ahead and lay a, a, um, another sheet over it. So I, I basically just sandwich all the paper and all the sheets. And then I, I use a lot of boards in order to um, create weight to push the water out. Um, here in this image, I'm sort of playing with one the shape um and then i'm in, embossing um also shapes into the paper which is really fun and whenever the paper dries after um i take it out of the the, the sandwich <laughs> i let it dry and it basically um the the water you know comes out of the paper and it dries and this is sort of how it will look and whenever it's dry, I can pretty much do whatever I want. So here are examples of me stitching into the paper. Um, and then I'll kind of show you some other cool stuff that I did. The one on the right here is I was playing around with um, grass, really thick pieces of grass, and I was stitching it into the paper. And then the one on the left is quill work. So it's quilling into the paper. So kind of where I've been since the Goodman, um, since I received the Goodman uh, Fellowship. Here's some work that I've, I've done. Again, this is my printmaking with the same image on process. Um, these pieces, I was really getting into uh, quill work and I was interested in, in just the beautiful ways that quills look when they're laid flat. And, you know, you kind of do like a crotch, uh, cra um, a cross stitching and zoomed up. This is how sort of how the stitching looks. So this is me just mimicking the quill work design in my printmaking. And that was a small series that I did. And then here with the paper making, um, again, I was, I, I've been super into the, the paper making. I sort of, I'm, I've, I've kind of stepped away from printmaking, but I'm not completely like, I'm not done printmaking. I just sort of, I've been really intrigued with how I can play with paper. So these ones, I did a small series, uh, last summer during the pandemic. Um, I, was stuck in my tiny little apartment and I still had scraps of small um, finished paper pieces and had a lot of beads because I, I do a lot of bead work as well. I'm kind of on my own. And I was just like, well, I'm just going to go ahead and beat on some paper because I need, I need an outlet <laughs> and I don't have a studio. And this was really, um, these pieces I think are only six by six. They're pretty small. So I was able to work on these in my little living room. Um, yeah, and I, and it also was um, sort of missing, like having, you know, being confined to my little apartment. I was like looking out my window and missing nature. So this is kind of, these works are inspired by the clouds and the mountains and uh, the grass, you know, anything in nature that I, I was really needing at the time. Here's some more pieces um, again with, with the beads. Um, the really cool thing about making paper is I can also um, throw in other materials. Like I was adding in medicine material. So I was putting a lot of like sweet grass and sage um, and cedar into my paper. So those, when you look at the paper, you can kind of see those uh, on the surface, like the one on the left here um, of the square, you can kind of see like a little piece of 
like a line there, and that's actually a piece of um, sweet grass. And then here's another piece where I incorporated, um, incorporated beadwork and quilt work. Um, again, just sort of playing with shapes and um, a lot of abstract visuals here and colors. Um, so after, um, during the pandemic, uh, again, I was sort of stuck in my apartment, smart making these like small beaded pieces. I also ended up applying for, um, a couple of residencies and I was really lucky and so thankful to receive them. Um, I, I got, I received the, um, SAR Native American, uh, artist fellowship and residency in Roswell, I'm um, sorry, in Santa Fe. I got that one last summer, um, which I'm so thankful for. And then I also received the Roswell Artisan Residence Program in Roswell, New Mexico. And uh, the SAR residency was during the summer last year. And then at the end of last year, I was able to start a year long residency in Roswell, um, which I'm actually finishing now. Like this is literally my last week of the residency, um, but I'll kind of show you what I was playing with during that my residency here. This is um, a piece I was able to uh, work with um, a local artist who had a laser machine, which I was really like thankful for because um, I was able to continue pushing my my paper again. Um, this is the piece that I sort of played with using um, incorporating another material, which is leather, which I don't really have a lot of experience working with. Um, but here I, I really fell in love with the the way um, the overall piece came out. Here's some more detailed shots of that piece. So um, kind of playing with this this idea, this was kind of like the first one playing with the, the leather and seeing how, you know, how it kind of played together. I really, really loved that. And so I ended up, um, and then also incorporating installation. I ended up finishing my res uh, Roswell residency with an installation using the same idea. And that's my finished piece. Um, that I did while I was here in, in Roswell. This is a, an installation. It's a pretty large piece. It took up, um, so the overall size of the space was 20 by 20 feet by 10 feet, and I think 12 feet high. Um, I took up half that room with this installation. And the cool thing about the Roswell Museum is they have a collection here. They have the Aston Collection, which is um, uh, a large collection of native um, objects. And there was an object that I fell in love with while I was here. And it's a Lakota beaded dress, um, traditional dress. And that dress sort of inspired kind of this installation. And so I invited the dress in the installation with, um, in conversation with my work. So this is the, the overall um, show. I had the dress included. Um, I custom made the uh, base and the two pieces sort of um, faced each other and um, reflect each other. The really cool thing about this um, this show is that uh, the dress is facing north. I thought that was really important for me because I'm from the north. Um, being from South Dakota, I was sort of, well, also while I was here, I was missing home a lot. And uh, being in New Mexico, I do miss home a lot. Um, but I, uh, I just have, I have, a, I have a, a connection to New Mexico, so I can't necessarily have like this weird relationship where I like, I miss home a lot, but I love being here. So I'm just kind of in balance with that. I mean, it's not that I don't ever go home. I just, um, while I'm here, I, I think about home a lot. Um, 
Yeah. And that's sort of the front view of the show. The show was up in Roswell from September. Uh, actually, I lied. Um, no, no. September 4th to October 10th. Um, I just took the show down a few weeks ago. And um, yeah. Thank you. That is my presentation. That was incredible. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, I have so many things to say but um, and questions to ask you, but I will um, ask folks in the audience to do again, please type your questions in the chat. Um, so I, that was just really wonderful. And I just love the way that you organized your presentation and talking about but your earlier works. And I love that one of those first ones that you showed um, from 2019, the wealth piece. Um, and I was wondering if you, I don't, if you could talk a little bit more about your inspiration behind that body of work. Yeah. <clears throat> so during that time, um, I was really, I mean, I noticed, well, I didn't notice. So a lot of my inspiration comes from, of course, my own culture. Um, and I was just looking at the um, our traditional dresses a lot. You know, our, our dresses hold so much um, power, so much energy. Like there's so much that goes into them. I, I mean, like paper making, like uh, print making, like, um, you know, very process based. So a dress is very process based. Like you have to make, you have to process the leather. Um, but then you also, you also think about where the leather comes from, you know, it lives a whole entire life before it becomes a dress. Um, so it's just really interesting, like all of the, the background of the dress, that's kind of where a lot of my inspiration comes from, or I, I think about a lot. So with that printmaking, sorry, with the prints that you were mentioning, um, the, the designs on there are elk tooth, um, they're elk teeth. And the way that they're positioned is the way that they'd be positioned on a dress. And they basically symbolize wealth and um, not wealth in that, you know, I'm, I have all this rich, I'm rich or whatever. It's more of like family wealth and wealthy in that you come from a really strong tribe. Um, you're very cared for and you wear that proudly. And so that's sort of where that came from. And I was playing with that same image a lot in my print making. And it, and it definitely transfers into my paper making as well. You can kind of see that I, I continue to get those shapes cut out of my paper. And it's just something that's so powerful for me. That's yeah. It comes from. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, those last few images that you shared of your... Um, your piece in Roswell in juxtaposition with the dress in their collection was incredibly powerful and just really spectacular. Um, and I love what you said about the dress facing north um, in terms of just a nod to home and all of that. Um, and I'm just always really interested in um, the value of museum collections. I mean, from my own perspective, it's what are these collections for if not for artists like you? So I'm wondering, um, if you've had other experiences, maybe when you were at SAR with looking at um, other museum collections, and if you've had another experience where historic um, pieces from your community have impacted your work. How it impacted? Mm -hmm. um, I definitely, on a very low level, get to um, see collections. Uh, I have a collection in my own hometown that I actually got to work at a few times. I interned while I was in school. Um, so I have like a really like, you know, embedded connection to the one at home. Um, I mean, it's open to the community and every time I go home, I always, always go and I always look at the, and the really cool thing about looking at the collection at home for me is that those are items that are from my community members. They're items that, um, that are also being taken care of by my community members. That's really important um, versus like coming here to Roswell uh, or even, um, well, SAR is different. SAR definitely has more of like a, a community, um, more community engaged, I think. Um, the, the, I have gone through that collection before. 
um, when I was doing my undergrad, but when I was uh, there during my residency, it was during the pandemic. So they were very cautious about um, anybody being in the collection or just, you know, so I actually didn't have the opportunity to physically see the collection. Um, but I got to visually look at images. Um, my time there was very short and I, I realized that, um, I had to find a very, a more, um, a quicker way to work. <laughs> so I didn't get to spend a whole lot of time in that collection. Um, but while I was here in Roswell, of course I had a whole year. Um, and I didn't really think about using the collection as part of my, um, my, fin my final, you know, installation. Um, but I, I just kind of, I kept visiting cause it's on a permanent display in the, in the museum, the dress with other items. And I sort of just kept going back almost regularly. Um, I was like really drawn to the dress. Um, not just like visually or like aesthetically, but like emotionally in a way, like I was, uh, I was kind of getting into, um, getting a little bit into like NACRA and reading about like the NACRA laws and things like that. And so I was just really interested in, um, you know, having the opportunity to like pull this dress out of, out of the corner basically, and like letting it be seen. So for me, I think, uh, I don't know, it was like kind of a way to like, like brings, bring life to something, you know? So that's kind of like where that came from. I think that answered your question. I hope that did. <laughs> it, that was a fabulous answer. Um, and absolutely, I feel like um, the juxtaposition of the two works really activates that dress um, in a way that hopefully makes visitors down there um, think more critically about issues such as NAGPRA and how that dress ended up at that institution and why that matters. Um, so that's very cool. Thank you for sharing that um, again. Um, so thinking a little bit more about process as well, um, I'm never going to look at my blender the same way. <laughs> um, I'm <laughs> like, how did you come to that process? Uh, well, actually, again, uh, <laughs> when I was doing my undergrad, it was the last year of my undergrad. And um, of course, me focusing in uh, printmaking. I just, I was doing so much printmaking that I was like, I needed to focus on, I needed to like, cause I was so stressed out. I needed to do something else. And, and um, my, my professor, Neil Ambrose Smith, he just sort of bring in a used blender one day and was like, Hey, let's make some paper. And I was like, okay. And I was thinking that too, it's like a blender. That's so random. And I, I thought about making paper before and until he just was like, I think he was bored too. He was all like, and eh, we do printmaking every day. Let's do something else just for fun. And then we made paper and I was like, wow, okay. And then I just kept doing it and kept doing it. And then after that, I was like, okay, blenders, blenders, blenders. And I was always going to the thrift store anyway. And I would just start collecting blenders. But it was so funny because I I um, wanted to incorporate uh fabric because I really love fabric and I threw fabric in a blender I broke the blender <laughs> so I would just constantly like be breaking them all the time and that's sort of where that came from um yeah but the really cool thing while I was here in Roswell is um another former resident that was here that I got to be really good friends with I'm so thankful for him he actually had a paper beater. So it's this huge like tank and it, it's like this huge, like, um, I can't think of what it's called, but it, it basically pushes the water around and it, and it beats the paper. And I could put so much paper in it and just let it do it for hours. And I, could, I made, I was able to make a lot of paper. That's sort of where this, um, installation came from because the paper, is actually about maybe half an inch thick it's super thick yeah so it's very the boxes are very strong it's just really funny because you would think like wow paper is so easy to tear but no 
you can make it very um, resilient. <laughs> and that's sort of what I did with the boxes is made them very strong. Um, not just visually, but, you know, like physically, they're pretty strong. Yeah. And that also speaks really well to the power of that dress and the strength embodied in that dress, not only physically, but visually and culturally, et cetera. So that's a great um, addition to that and thinking about that. I'm so bummed that I wasn't able to see that. Um, but yeah, cool. It was only a very short time. Yeah. But I did get more pictures this time. So yeah. Yeah. So speaking of pictures, um, your installation at II for your senior thesis as well um, was really interesting. And I can really see how that like the building blocks of that for your exhibition at Roswell as well. Um, so that was really interesting to see. And so I'm wondering if there was any, how you kind of looked at installation work differently based on that process, based on that exhibit that you did at IAIA and then coming into Roswell, because they were several years apart. I think with the, the my senior show, I definitely was like, well, I, 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 at that point, I was kind of like, I don't really want to put work on the wall. Like, I don't really, I'm not really interested in that. I want to be able to like have space from the wall. So at that time, I was just kind of like, okay, well, I'll just suspend these pieces because they, they, I also didn't want to put them in frames. I didn't want them to be high. Again, I didn't want them to be behind a glass. Um, I mean, there's definitely a connection there uh, with all of that. Um, and so with the senior show, they, which is really interesting that I didn't think about when I installed it is that the work also sort of was breathing. And what I meant, mean by that is because it, it was suspending, it doesn't have anything that really holds it down. So it's really interesting that it moved. Um, I really liked that about that. And so I kind of wanted to go back to that. And that's kind of why I really pushed like this more sculptural um, way of doing it instead of having the flat work. Um, and with the installation that I did in Roswell, I really wanted to just take up space. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I thought, because at first I was really nervous about filling that whole room. It's a pretty large room. You walk in there and you're like, wow, uh, it's a little intimidating. Um, but my boxes, because I, I only ever seen my boxes in my studio. And I, and I never actually hung all of them up together. But once I put them up, they really, they really, they really stood on their own a lot. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that it, I, I'm just really, I was really interested in just taking up space um, visually. And those boxes definitely did that versus having them sort of space from the wall from like my senior show. This, this was, I was able to um, take up more space. <laughs> yeah, I love that answer. And it really also disrupts the, um, the idea of having Native art in particular tucked away in glass cases, you know, so really commanding a space and um, really reclaiming ownership over that space, especially um, given the collections that they have down there in Roswell. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, we have a question from Rob who asks if you have done collaborations with other artists. I have um, actually, again, while I was in Roswell, I was part of a group collaboration where we created a um, a sculpture, uh, a huge metal sculpture that involved uh, plasma cutting, which is, I'm not used to plasma cutting, but I am used to creating vectors on Illustrator. That's where I get my designs cut for my paper. And so that's sort of was a really cool project. Um, I collaborated with Marty Tubles Jr., uh, Keith Braveheart, and Laylee Long Soldier. Um, we we're all um, we're all Oglala. We're all from Pine Ridge. Uh, we collaborated on a piece together that um, a public community piece for our our community. 
And then um, I also collaborated with a printmaker from Tamron. Um, I feel so bad. I totally forgot her name, but I collaborated with the uh, uh, printmaker. Um, I did some stone prints and let's see who else. I think that's, that's it. Yeah. Um, have you ever done any work with Taryn? Taryn last. I haven't. I haven't. I'm surprised that we haven't. Like we're totally, they're, we're really good friends. Um, I don't know. I think we're just so like busy with our own work. We just were just never thought about it. I don't know. Yeah. So for those in the audience, Taryn Laskin um, is one of our other former Goodman um, fellows. And he is also just an incredible printmaker as well. Um, and I think your work really speaks well to each other. Um, I was thinking about him in particular when you were showing those small beaded pieces that you were working on during the pandemic. And um, that just made me think of his work as well. That would be very cool for you guys to be in conversation together. Yeah, that would. Okay, so I think um, we can wrap it up here. We have a comment saying, thank you for a great presentation and for sharing your unique skills, especially the paper making process, which I will echo. Um, I've learned yeah. a huge amount during this conversation and I feel so lucky to be able to um, learn from you and hear about all the wonderful work that you are doing. And I think we're all really excited to see what you're gonna do next. So thank you everybody for joining and thank you so much for being here this morning in the midst of your move. Um, <laughs> I really appreciate the taking the time to chat with us. Thank you. Thank you so much.